Good evening, and welcome to the Mill Valley Historical Society's First Wednesday Speaker Series, an event we host the first Wednesday of every month. My name is Deborah Schwartz, and I'm on the board of directors for the Mill Valley Historical Society in charge of the Oral History Program and the First Wednesday Speaker Series. It is my hope as director of this series to bring to you all an array of historical topics to explore. Last month, we turned our focus to the rich history of music in Mill Valley in a lively conversation with Prune Music owners David Kessner, Randall Smith, Bill Steele, and Larry Craig. With us tonight is John Goddard, owner of Village Music. Village Music is a record store so highly regarded to many, it will always be known as the best little record store in the world. But before we begin, we want to thank the Mill Valley Public Library for allowing us to host our speaker series in this safe and accessible format. Helping to keep things on track is librarian Franklin Waller. You can't see him, he's the man behind the curtain and his support is much appreciated. Before we begin, I want to say to those of you in the audience who are already members of the Mill Valley Historical Society, Thank you for your generosity and your interest. Your membership allows us to continue our efforts to infuse history into the present through speaker presentations such as tonight's, oral interviews, history walks, history plaques, and the collaboration to restore and return to Mill Valley engine number nine, the last remaining locomotive from the Mount Tamalpais Scenic Railway. For those of you who are not yet members, please join us. Membership ensures that you will be alerted to future talks such as tonight's, our annual Memorial Weekend Walk into History Tour, Chuck Olenberg's char charming Mill Valley history vignettes, and you will be updated about other historical events in our town and nearby. Membership to our organization is so affordable and just a click away on the Mill Valley Historical Society website. For practical purposes, the audience must be muted for this webinar, but functional tools are located at the bottom of your screen to help us communicate with each other. If you can't see them now, just hover your cursor over the area and they should appear. Now look for the chat icon. The chat tool allows you to post comments, say hello to friends, and we encourage you to add substantive information during this presentation. Now look for the Q&A option. The Q&A option is where you can post questions you may have about tonight's presentation. And I'll address those questions to, to John after his talk and maybe even fit them in during the talk. But if you have comments or personal stories to share, the chat room is the best place for that. And sometimes we'll even talk about some of the comments. Tonight's talk will be in a Q&A format that will last about an hour and after we'll take more time for questions and comments from the audience. This event is being recorded and will be available on the Mill Valley Historical Society website in about three or four days. Just go to our website, click events, select first Wednesday lecture series, and you'll find tonight's recordings as well as many others. In the 1960s and 70s, Mill Valley was a bastion of musical creativity and performance. Sweetwater Music Hall is presently celebrating 50 years of feeding the soul of Mill Valley and Greater Bay Area with music, art, and community. But equally impactful was Prune Music and Village Music, two local shining gems in a rich world of sound and creativity. John Goddard grew up in Mill Valley, attending Park School, Edna McGuire, Alto School, and Marin Catholic High. John Goddard went to work for Mu Village Music at just 13 years old when it was a mom and pop store in the Sequoia Theater building. In 1968, John dropped out of college at the same time Village Music's owner, Sarah Wilcox, decided to retire. Sarah Wilcox was in the process of selling the business to a retired sheet music salesman, but he died from heart of a heart attack on the way to sign the papers. So John stepped in as manager, eventually buying the business in February of 1968, 
transforming it into a destination for locals, musicians worldwide, and collectors of vintage vinyl records. The influence of village music cannot be overstated. Musician Huey Lewis aptly, aptly describes village music as an American treasure, a temple of, an American, of American popular music. So it is my great pleasure to welcome with us tonight, John Goddard. John? Hi, Deborah. How are you? Good. I'm so happy you're with us today. Well, thank you. Me too. Yeah. You know, we're, we live next to each other, so it's kind of funny to talk to you through the box. Yes, it is. On the it is. I'm used to you walking by the house. Yes, yes. Well, always good to see you. It's good to see you. So let's let's just, I mean, where to begin with village music? Um, why don't we start in the beginning, okay? A little bit about you. You're a real hometown boy, aren't you, John? I'm a hometown boy. Uh, my mom was actually born in Mill Valley. My grandparents moved here in the 1890s. And where did they come from? Uh, my grandmother was from Ireland. My grandfather was from France. Huh. And they met somewhere between there and Mill Valley. <laughs> so your and your dad was the town doctor. Uh, yes, he was from Texas originally, and he was he was one of the town doctors in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. I remember you telling me once that he delivered some of your friends. Uh, quite a few of my customers, yeah. Yeah. And so when did your interest in collecting begin? Uh, I've collected as long as I can remember. I, I've always been a collector. I collected coins at one point. I collected stamps. I collected comic books. Uh, I went through a phase where I collected birds' nests. Um, just there was always collections going on, some of which still go on. But, and but when I was uh, when I was thirteen, I got an Elvis Presley record for Christmas, and about three or four months later, I saw Little Richard at Mission High School in San Francisco, and it literally changed my life. Soon after that, I went to work for Village Music. And that was your choice. It's like, I must have music and this is where I will work. Yes. Yeah, that's that's basically what happened. So you, what do you do at 13 years old? In the store? Uh-huh. Uh, I, I don't know if you remember the Phonolog catalog. It was this huge catalog that was in most record stores, thousands of pages, and they got refills three times a week. And my first job was inserting the new pages and taking out the old ones. How much did you make an hour? I really don't know, because I think I, I probably took it all in records. <laughs> I'm, not sure I, I, I'm not sure I ever really got cash. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's originally why I started working there was because I got a discount on records. So talk, let's talk about the first Village Music then. I mean, give us a little idea of what Mill Valley was like at the time and, and the owner of the original Village Music and where it was located. Uh, well, uh, Village Music originally opened in the 40s uh, by a guy named Fred Larson, and it was on Madrone, um, about halfway between where the old Sweetwater was and the Mill Valley Salvage Shop, halfway up the hill there. And it moved to the Sequoia Theater building in the early 50s and was taken over by, I think it was called Hoy's Music in San Rafael. They had a record store in San Rafael right across the street from the Rafael Theater. And they owned it for a couple of years and Sarah Wilcox worked there. And then she took it over in the mid 50s. And then I started working for her in 57. So what kind of music was in this? It was, it was, it was basically just, it was a music store. It wasn't really a record store. I mean, they sold records, but mm -hmm. they also had record players and guitars and metronomes and um, sheet music instruction books and tambourines and radios and all that kind of stuff. So it was, you know, records were most of it, but it wasn't by any means all of it. Uh huh. And it was a small store. It, it's a, it was a tiny store. It was probably... I'd be surprised if it was more than 600 square feet. 
and it had a listening booth where you could go in and listen to records. Really? Yeah, but it was it was tiny. I, I don't know if you've been in the in the store where it used to be. It's a Tibetan little gift store in the Sequoia Theater building, and it's a very small space. Oh yes. Yeah, but that's where it was. And then in '61, when they tore down the gas stations and built the building where I later the store later was in, um, even that the original space was only about a thousand square feet. And so here you are, young man, natural collector. You get into music and you start going to shows. I mean, you're, you're in Mill Valley. You're across the bridge from San Francisco. Yeah, I started, I started very early. Like I said, I saw Little Richard when I was in the eighth grade. Um, a few months later, I went to a show at the Civic Auditorium in San Francisco, which several books have called the ultimate rock and roll tour. I mean, it was Fats Domino, Chuck Berry, the Everly Brothers, Eddie Cochran, Buddy Holly and the Crickets, Clyde McFadder and the Drifters, Laverne Baker, Paul Anka, and several others. I mean, it was just, and that's that's where it started. And then within a year, within six months after that, I was hopping the bus to go down to San Jose to go to the Rhythm and Blues shows at the San Jose Civic Auditorium. And I saw people like, as early as 57, 58, I saw people like Ray Charles and Jackie Wilson and James Brown and B.B. King and the Platters and Bobby Blue Bland and Lloyd Price. And it just, and it went from there. Did you meet these performers when you would go? Were you one um, of the kids at the board? really. I mean, I, I, actually the first show I went to in San Jose was Bobby Blue Bland, Junior Parker and the Platters. And I got my first <laughs> autograph from Junior Parker in the lobby. That was mm -hmm. the first time I'd ever asked anybody for an autograph. And then I think it was either one or two shows after that for Hank Ballard and the Midnighters. I tore a poster off a phone pole out in front of the building after the concert. And that started my poster collection. So it, I started and I brought a camera. I was, I was up there. I was this little white kid in the front row taking pictures when I was 13, 14 years old. And you went by yourself? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Did you go with uh, I went to I, I went to Marin Catholic. I was, I think, literally the only kid in the school that was interested in music. I know I went to a lot of parties because I, I had the only record collection in the school. Um, and none of my none of my friends, um, several of my friends did a token. I'll go to one show with you and did that. But it, nobody, nobody I hung out in high school was even remotely interested in music more than having the radio on. Did you study music? No. Did you play anything? You, you had no inclination? Um, to play. I got a guitar for Christmas in the late 50s, and I couldn't play What I Say by New Year's, so I quit. <laughs> Patience is not one of my strong suits. And I just, so that was, I, I had a guitar for a week. Interesting. Other, other than that, it was just record player. <laughs> So tell us, tell us how you came to own Village Music. I mean, when we've talked in the past, you talked about you dropped out of college and then you applied for a job as a mailman, right? Well, I, I, I basically, I went to college for six and a half years and I was basically majoring in draft evasion. <laughs> and I, I didn't care about college. The only thing I really learned in college was accounting 1A, which helped me later on. But that that's, I was not there to get a college education. I was there to live the college lifestyle and not get drafted. And about the time, I, I guess this was like late 67, early 68. And I had, during college, I'd worked part-time at Village Music when I was home for a day or two. And uh, I also, I managed a record department in a discount store called Gemco, which was kind of like a poor man's white front or a, you know, a baby target, something like that. And I managed a record department in there for a while. And I worked in a record store in San Jose for about a year and a half right before then. And, and I applied for the post office because that was a steady gig and took, took the test, passed the test. And right about then, 
Um, I got a call from Sarah Wilcox mentioning that she was thinking of selling the store and had a buyer and he was looking for somebody to management. It was this very elderly retired sheet music salesman. And I said, you know, I'm interested, but I, you know, I'm, I'm stuck in school. And about that time I got my draft notice and I went in for a physical, got out of the draft. Um, the day I flunked my physical, I went down and dropped out of school, called Sarah, said, I'm in, I'll, I'll do it. And literally the day that they were going to sign the papers, the guy dropped dead of a heart attack. So Sarah was desperate. And I said, you know, why don't, why don't you let me run it for a percentage of the profits and I'll, I'll buy it from you. And that's what we did. And, and within a year, the store was totally mine, but it was just, it was fake. Absolutely. And about 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 three months after I, I started working in the store, I, I got my job offer from the post office. <laughs> What's the first thing you did when you when the store was yours? When you took the very office? first thing I did, the, the first day I took over, I put up a Janice Joplin poster in the window. And it was a Bob, Bob Seidemann, very famous poster of Janice, and I was a huge Janice Joplin freak. Uh, that was the first thing I did the first day I was there. And it was the last thing I took down when the store was closed. It was empty. All the stock was out. All the bins were out. Everything was off the walls. The very last thing I did before I turned the key over to the landlord was take down the Joplin poster. So it was it was there for the whole ride. <laughs> that is a good picture. Yes, it was. And I went through three or four of them. I mean, they would wear out or fade or peel, and I'd, I'd get another one and replace it. But there was there was never a day in my 40 years at Village Music that a poster was not in the window. Did Janice ever come into your store? Uh, no. A few of the members of the band did, but uh, Janice never did. Yeah. I, I, did meet her, I did meet her once on a street corner, but she never came in the store. Yeah, I interviewed uh, Dave Getz, and he is also a First Wednesday presenter like you are. And mm -hmm. um, he, I know he came into the store and mentioned that. Yeah, he, Dave was a, Dave came in fairly regularly. Peter Albin came in regularly. Mm -hmm. um, but Janice, no. Mm -hmm. And Jim Gurley came in a few times. What What has Village Music brought to you in your life? What is, has, has it given you? I mean, you... You uh, open up it, the store. It seems like you're given me a house in the redwood trees. It's given me three meals a day, and it's given me a whole lot of fun. <laughs> you know, it was. Uh, I didn't do it to be rich, but I did. I figured if I could support myself, have a place to live, eat regularly, and and have some fun, that's all I really needed. And feed my and feed my record collection. Do you think of yourself as a businessman? No. No. If I was a businessman, I would have quit selling records in the late 80s and started selling just CDs. Um, if I was a businessman, um, in the early 70s, I opened two more stores. I had one in San Anselmo and one in Runner Park and was going to be a record mogul. And it just it took me three years to realize it wasn't me. So I went back down to my one store so I could do it right. And I'm really glad I did it. I'm really glad I got it out of my system at a real early age. <laughs> Let's one. I remember when I moved to Mill Valley in the late seventies, and of course, if you come to Mill Valley, you're going to end up at Village Music if you're at all interested in looking in the window. And your windows were compelling, and looking inside. Let's let's. Let's get some pictures of the store up here. Franklin will show some pictures. And I, I call, I kind of frame this question as when collection becomes art. So let's talk about what we're looking at here. Here's the interior of the store. What do we see besides what seems to be organized chaos? Uh, it's organized chaos um, over on the on the left side, you can see Shelly Winters up top. Uh, down below her, you can see Tanya Tucker. Uh, then you move over, there's a jukebox. Um, those are opera records. Um, 
and there's there's snapshots that I took in the 50s on the door there. And then next to that, you've got uh, autograph photographs. And you've got, uh, you know, just a little bit of, of everything. You know, there's um, old movie posters on the walls. There's magazines. Um, there was a section of rock and roll magazines on one wall. There was a section of, of Playboy Adam Nugget kind of magazines with Jane Mansfield and Marilyn Monroe and people like Jane Fonda on the covers. There's just um, up in the upper right-hand corner, there's a cardboard cutout of Artie Shaw with a Grateful Dead laminate pass on his on his coat. Uh, so it's just um, it's just a mixture of this and that and everything else, but it all it all goes together. I mean, I learned I learned that from Bill Graham shows at the Fillmore. If you if you mix it up enough, it works. And I later discovered that when I was doing my store anniversary and Christmas parties. It doesn't have to go together. If, it, if you mix it up enough, it works beautifully. So you can have a gospel group and a R and b group and a rock group all on the same bill, and it works. Well, it is said that your store had one of everything. That, that was my quest. I, when I took over the store, my ideal would have been to have one of everything, just so that no matter how weird the request was, I could go, yeah, it's over here. That, and it's all, was... you know, it's all valid. I mean, whether you're, whether you're collecting David Bowie or collecting George Jones or collecting Thelonious Monk or collecting Lawrence Welk or Bing Crosby, it's all, to the people that are doing the collecting, it's valid. Elvis Costello, the musician, says, Mu village music is like a library, only you have to buy things rather than check them out. Bobby Weir says your store is an American music heritage. History and contemporary all rolled into one. This store has been described as a fantasy, a museum, an American treasure, a temple of American popular music, a store that has one of everything. Oh, John, sure. Describe how you see your own store. Um, I, I saw my own store as kind of a repository of things that I thought were cool, whether it was comic books or movie magazines or rock and roll memorabilia or whatever. Um, and I also saw it as the kind of store that I wish I could have found when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. where I could walk in and say, do you have such and such? And, and it was there. And there was never, there was never a store like that when I was growing up. I, the closest, the closest that ever came was in the early days of Tower Records. They, they put up a good fight early on. But even, even at that, they didn't branch it out as much as they could have. I mean, you definitely get the feeling like this is the ultimate John Goddard man cave. <laughs> This is it is that's that's exactly what it was. That that's probably the best description anybody's ever given. It was my it was my retail man cave. <laughs> You've been described as a taste maker. What do you think is meant by that? Well, I, I you know, it got to the point after I'd been in the store a while, people would actually come in and ask me for recommendations. And more often than not, they worked. At least I never heard about the ones that didn't. But when people were coming in asking me for recommendations, it was people like Jerry Garcia and Elvis Costello and Bobby Weir and B.B. King. B.B. Uh, King used to come in the store really, really regularly. And uh, he would come in. And he'd go through the blues section every time he came in, but he'd say, I want some big band records this time. And so I'd go out and pick out a couple of hundred big band records and he'd go through them and buy 90% of them. And the next time he'd come in, he'd go, I want to get some country records this time. And I'd go pick out a couple of hundred of them and he'd buy 90% of them. And next time he'd come in, he wanted some big, uh, some pop vocalist records or old rock and roll records. And it was like, 
he'd do his blues thing and just let me pick out stuff for him. And that felt really good. <laughs> let's, let's take a look at some of the photographs of you with some of the musicians that come to visit you at the store. Franklin, tell us about this photo, John. Um, Cab Calloway was playing a, con a benefit up in Santa Rosa. And I just, on a fluke, I called the promoter and said, can you put me in touch with Cab's people? I want to, I, I'd like to see if he would do an in-store, knowing that it would never happen. And um, I got this call from his daughter saying, yes, we'd love to. And so th this was one of the first in-stores I ever did. And I mean, Cab was one of my heroes. I mean, he's on, he's been my logo for, since the mid, er, mid to early 70s. That, is that him right there? Um, yeah, that, that's Cab Calloway. That, I, ah, so he's standing right next to your logo, which is him. Yeah. And um, the gift wrap box that I'm holding in my hand is T-shirts and fans and buttons and bumper strips, all the stuff that I had never got permission to print. I figured he's going to come in and I'm going to, in two days, I'm going to hear from his attorney saying, you can't do this. And so I gave him this huge box of just stuff and never had a problem. His, his, his daughter used to call me every few years and go, um, we're doing a benefit event in New York. Could you send me 500 buttons with Cab's picture on them? And I said, sure. And I'd send them on off or, you know, fans. Uh, you can see on the sign there, those are Cab Calloway fans. So let's see and, another photo. Uh, she'd, go, she'd go, can you send me a couple of hundred fans? And I'd say, sure, I can. <laughs> What a relief. And so that's, yeah, it was a relief. Ah, you say nice things about this man, John. Well, I was through the years became a very, very close friend. Um, his very first American tour, his very first gig on his first American tour was at the old Waldorf in San Francisco. He flew into San Francisco drove over to Howard Johnson's in Mill Valley where a lot of the rock people stayed because they didn't want to stay in the city. Hopped in, hopped in whoever was driving him around and came to Village Music and Sweetwater. Those were his, his first two stops on the very first, his very first day in America. And he was a regular ever since then. And this is Elvis Costello for those that yes. don't recognize him. Yeah. And let's see another photo. Tiny uh, Tim. Again, he was uh, playing in the city, and I got a hold of somebody in the, that was connected with booking him, and I talked Jeannie into booking him and at Sweetwater, and I figured I'd try for an in-store, and I asked if he'd like to do an in-store, and I got a yes, and this is Tiny Tim signing autographs in my store. And is that a picture of him behind you? In behind me yeah look uh, at your head the back of your head uh no that's a display of old uh that's a display of old sheet music that is tiny tim on that one but most yes. of it is most of it is early sheet music from the teens and 20s yeah no i and thought he, that was him he, he looked at all the sheet music and and knew the words to every one of the songs i couldn't believe it what are the flowers yours you to him or him to you uh somebody a uh, customer to him oh Okay. And let's, any other photos of people coming through? Oh, yes. Now this is something that you did regularly. You had performances there. Uh, yeah, we did. Which is amazing. It's not that big of a place. No, uh, we, we figured it out. We, you know, we, we'd move a few bins around and tuck a few things in the corner and set up a little PA system. And it, it worked. Um, that's the Rowan brothers, but. Um, Is that Lauren in the middle? Uh, that's Lauren in the middle. Yes. Peter on the right, Chris on the left. Um, but we did it with the jo Christmas jug band. We did it with Otis Clay and Ann Peebles. Uh, we did it with a guy named Terry Evans. We did it with a guy named Swamp Dog. We did it with Nick Lowe, did it with Elvis Costello. Did it with JJ Kale. And did you charge for these performances? Oh, no. no. 
<laughs> uh, never charged for my in stores, never charged for my parties. My, my parties were all invitation only. Uh, so back to Tastemaker. I remember you telling me a story about George Lucas, who lived down on Throckmorton for a time, correct? Mm -hmm. Way back, yeah. Will you tell that story? Yeah. About uh, the music? He was a pretty regular customer for a long time. Um, and he came in, he came in one afternoon after all the Star Wars stuff blew up. And I mentioned to him, I wanted to thank him for making one of my favorite movies. And I'm sure he was waiting for me to say, oh, Star Wars. Yeah, it was a lot of, you know, whatever. And I said, American Graffiti. And he goes, well, I'm glad you enjoyed it because I researched the entire soundtrack out of your store. And that made me feel really good. And he came in, uh, he came in not too long after that. They were working on The Empire Strikes Back and he bought almost six feet of world music albums, very, very, very esoteric African and Asian and South America, very extremely esoteric stuff. And I asked him what this was for. And he goes, well, I'm, I'm researching sound effects for my Ewoks. When you say six feet, you mean tall, I mean, stacked? It was a pile of records, almost as tall as I am. Or as tall as I was, yeah. How much would that cost? Oh, Back I don't then. remember. It was, it was, it was a goodly amount. <laughs> it's funny that you say by feet, because didn't you? You told me a story about BB King coming with the tour bus, right? And his yeah. Um, after I announced the store was closing, about about three months before we closed. Um, this huge tour bus pulled up in front of the store and I, I thought it looked like BB King's bus, but he wasn't in town. So it couldn't have been. And all of a sudden BB King gets out of his bus and comes into the store with his two guys. And he says, you know, I just, um, I had a few days off and I wanted to come to the store once more before it closed. And he rummaged around for almost four hours on his feet and, th and this was at a time when he was he was performing sitting down i mean he wasn't as as active as he used to be and um you know he spent the afternoon spent about four hours and again bought well more than six feet of records it was probably 10 or 12 feet of records and um as he, as he went out the door he told me you know he that he'd had a couple days off he got his guys to hop in the bus from his house in Vegas, drive to Mill Valley to come to the record store, and then they drove back to Vegas. How interesting it must be to have one of B.B. King's greatest fans tell you that he's one of your greatest fans. I mean... Oh, it, it was... It was... I mean, that, that's the kind of stuff I grew up listening to. I went from Elvis Presley to Little Richard to B.B. King and Muddy Waters within about six months. So this was this was one of my childhood heroes. And I'll never forget, he um, B.B. used to do a birthday tour of Mississippi every year, the week of his birthday. And I went down for one of them. And he was playing a midnight show at the very first club that he ever played in, in Indianola, Mississippi. And he entered, he dedicated a song to me and i thought god this is this is great and i was uh i was backstage at a memphis wc handy blues award show one year when bb king and carl perkins were the co-hosts and i went backstage to say hi after the show and bb king introduced me to carl perkins as the owner of the best record store in the country and, he, and carl goes oh i know we just did an in-store last year i've got a poster from it hanging in my family room and this is, I, I mean, these are my heroes. This isn't, this isn't just some, you know, as much as I love some rock stars that come in the store, this, this is a whole, whole other level and makes it, makes it worthwhile. It seems to me that although you're not a musician yourself, you have quite an impact on other musicians and directly, indirectly, 
in many ways are influencing their creativity, their music. I mean, for all intents and purposes, you're kind of a you're a musical influence. Well, you know, if if you listen to somebody's music for 30 years, you can find a figure out you can on some level, figure out what they like or what they would like if they heard it and what they wouldn't like. And and I apparently had a, a knack for doing that with a lot of people. One of my favorite singers, Betty Levette. Me too. States, states clearly, I mean, she is sensational, that you are responsible for saving her career expanding her career again it was a fluke it's not something i did on purpose i will take credit for it but i, I i'm not that modest but um i i probably my two favorite soul singers from the 60s were betty levette and a guy named howard tate both reasonably unknown and um i thought they were both dead and i i read in different magazines in the course of a time in 2002 that um a review of the betty levette concert in europe and a review of a howard tate concert in new orleans and um i thought god wouldn't it be great to throw a party and ha and see if i could get both of them and it it turned out my friend mike kappas at rosebud was sort of handling howard tate so i i connected that that dot and I read in the Betty Levette article that she was friends with a guy named Mac Rice, who was a songwriter who wrote, um, among other things, in the Midnight Hour and I think Knock on Wood and, and a lot of Atlantic soul hits. He'd, he'd originally been in a group called the Falcons with Wilson Pickett and Andy Floyd and uh, that th they were friends. And Mac Rice was a friend of a friend of mine. And I'd known that because Mac had performed with his band in a couple of gigs. And so I called my friend and I said, you know, can you can you get Mac Rice or can you call Mac Rice and see if you can get Betty Levette's phone number for me? I really want to try and book her out here and never thinking it would happen. And so Rico called me a few days later and he would talked to Mac Rice and gotten Betty's phone number. It took me three months to work up the nerve to call her because I thought this is just I, I can't do this. I. I can do Van Morrison, Elvis Costello, and, and Carlos Santana and Jerry Garcia, but I can't. I can't do Betty Levette. I mean, this is Betty Levette. And so I called her. We talked for over an hour. I talked her into coming out for my party. And um, at the party, she met Mike Kappas at Rosebud, who ended up becoming her her first real booking agent, pretty much ever. Um, she met Huey Lewis and a few months later sat in with him for a song on New Year's Eve in Las Vegas. Uh, she met Bonnie Raitt, who invited her the next year, her and I both, to the Rhythm and Blues Foundation Awards in New York and had her present an award. And the year after that, Betty got an award and Mike introduced her to a record company owner uh, from Anti Records. And it just it went it went from there. But it. It started at this little party in this little nightclub, Sweetwater. Hmm. You have had a nice affiliation with the Sweetwater. It's really been a, a nice combination, Sweetwater. Um, when Jeannie Patterson was there, and to a lesser extent, when Tom and Becky Steer were there, yeah. Mm -hmm. Jeannie and I had a, had a very, very close relationship. May she rest in peace. Yes. In my in the publicity for tonight's event, um, I put I put it on Facebook and uh, a local boy and musician, um, Bill Champlin, who I've interviewed as well and who has been a first Wednesday presenter too. Uh, he he writes about a little something. He writes about uh, village music, and I wanted to include it. Read it to you. He said, "I moved out of Mill Valley right before John took over." We used to have to drive to Oakland to go over to Reed's Records to find the R&B that we all craved. After John took over Village Music, I heard that the drive to Oakland wasn't needed as much as before. 
one of the reasons that Marin got funkier and funkier as time went on. We all listened to KDIA as kids and for a long time had to dig pretty deep to find that stuff. Village music was way cool after John took over. Nice little sentiment there. That's very nice. Yes. I do have to say, I, to the best of my knowledge, I have never met Bill Champlin. Huh. He may be the only Marin County musician I, as far as I know, I have never met. Well, we'll have to fix that. But I've certainly admired what he did, what he does. And so obviously village music becomes a destination for people from all over the world. Music fans, musicians, creative types, filmmakers. Movie stars. And what? Movie, movie stars. stars. Oh, yeah. movie stars. Who came to see what movie stars came? Oh, um, Matt Dillon, Noah Wiley, uh, Robert Wise, the guy that directed West Side Story and The Sound of Music. Hmm. Um, Drew Barrymore, Kevin Bacon, um, quite a few others. Of course, we've got our locals too. So Winona Ryder. Word gets around, obviously. Yeah. So at what point did you start to realize that village music is becoming an institution, has become an institution? This is a gathering place for people. People are coming from all over the place to, to see your store. I mean, you are you, you brought people I, to No Valley. I don't think I really realized it so much as so many people were telling me that was the case. I mean, it's certainly not something I, I set out to do. Was you know, there a negative you, kickback? You bringing in savory sorts to Mill Valley? Did anybody ever mention to you anything like that? Locals? Uh, not directly. I I heard it kind of off the wall in a few places. Um, I'll, I'll never forget a gentleman coming in and threatening to pick at my store because I had a picture of buckwheat on the wall. You also had. You had a lot of posters and Jimi Hendrix. I remember the Jimi Hendrix poster. My Jimi Hendrix poster. I had a guy in the early 70s named Marius who dressed like Jimi Hendrix, um, certainly did a lot of the same drugs as Jimi Hendrix, um, occasionally thought he was Jimi Hendrix, and he would come into my store for a long time, several times a week first thing in the morning to go to the back of the store talk to my Jimi Hendrix poster and you know explain what he'd been doing with his life you know how the weather was you know things are going great um I did this last night you know and just his little conversation it would last five or ten minutes and he'd wave as he walked out the door and a few days later he'd be in again to keep Jimmy up to date and he did that for a long long time and he was one of my favorite customers and he probably he never bought anything. I don't, and I don't think he ever bought anything, but uh, he was fun. And he used to scare people to death. I mean, people would just like either leave or go to the other end of the store when he was in there. You told me a great story about Lucinda Williams, the wonderful musician. <laughs> Share that, will you? Well, okay. Um, I had an employee. Um, Younger guy, extremely good looking. Um, and he, for for several years. Guy? Was huh? it the blonde guy? No, no, brown hair. Okay. No, this is not the blonde guy. Okay. Um, and for several years, whenever Lucinda Williams was, was in town, she would come by the store the second she hit the Bay Area grab Nigel by the ear, lead him out the door, and I wouldn't see him again until she left town. It was like her Bay Area one-stop shopping. Yeah. And this went on, this went on for several tours. <laughs> How about some other favorite customers? Don't know if it was the drugs or the sex, but... 
<laughs> oh, she's a great musician. An incredible musician. And a great lady. <laughs> uh, tell me about some of your other favorite customers. I mean, let's talk about some of the musicians alone who would come into your store regularly. You mentioned some of them. Carlos well, Santana. Um, Ry Cooter turned into a very good friend just from coming in the store. I mean, we, he, the reason Jeannie and I did the first anniversary party that my store threw was because he was Jeannie's favorite musician and there was just no way she could get Ry Cooter to play a club the size of Sweetwater. And I suggested, why don't I have an anniversary party and I'll see if I can talk him into playing. And he did. And that, that started the whole anniversary thing. But um, Ryan and I were very close. Um, I'd stay in his house when I went to LA. Uh, I went to several, I went to a Pop Staples recording session of his and a Terry Evans and several recording sessions. Um, I used to go to rehearsals of Rhythm and Blues Foundation Awards when he was in the house band. Um, I went with Ryan and his wife to Havana for a week. It was my, my one time out of the country. <laughs> And uh, it was just, it's a relationship that developed from him coming in the store. It was I the same with Elvis. I mean, I got, I got invited to his wedding. Um, it, and it was the same with, with several people. They just, they became friends more than customers or friends as, as well as customers. It must have felt like home walking into your store. When your world is music, being able to walk into an immersive experience like your place. I, mean, I like to think just so. One thing, you didn't walk in and walk out. Yeah. You walk in and grab you by the throat and it would be hard to leave. I mean, there oh, was I, so I, you know, I, had, uh, I had an amazing number of people, um, some musicians and, and, and just regular people, people that hardly ever bought anything. They just come in and check out the walls or look through the bins and see what was selling. Um, Bill Graham used to come in regularly. He never bought anything. He just came in to talk. You know. Marty Ballin. Well, Marty was a good customer. <laughs> Marty, Marty bought a lot of records. And he lived, you know, Marty lived two blocks down the street from the store. Mm -hmm. uh, for a long time, Bill Graham lived three blocks up the street from the store. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let's talk about some of your other employees. There's Gary. There's I Gary, who, there who, Eric Stool, who uh, owns Mill Valley Music. He worked for me for 25 years. Um, the guy in the middle is David Sinconan, who worked for me for several years and was just loads of fun. Um, Dan Vickery from Counting Crows worked in the store for a while. Um, Dan came to work in the store because he knew Elvis Costello hung out there and he figured if he worked there long enough, he would meet Elvis. <laughs> and he did. Um, Dan also, I was on a uh, vacation to New Orleans. And when I go on vacation, that's it. I mean, half the time Gary would run the store for me and wouldn't even know how to get a hold of me. But this one particular time, I was in New Orleans for three weeks and Gary and Dan were my only two employees. And Gary calls me and said, um, Dan just got hired by Counting Crows. He's leaving tomorrow. And so Gary ran the store for almost three weeks all by himself, was exhausted when he came back. But that's that's the kind of loyalty I had in employees. Um, David Grissom's son, Monroe, worked in the store for several years. Um, David Kolka, who was the son of the guy that ran one of the big recording studios in the city, uh, worked there for a while. There were a lot of a lot of musically oriented people that worked in the store. In fact, I never I never hired anybody off the street. I always hired people that had been regulars in the store and in constantly. And at some point, I would tap them on the shoulder and say, "Hey, you know, as long as you're here all the time, anyway, you want to work here for a while." <laughs> and that's how I hired people. You know. Is that Suki Hill photo there? Uh, yes, I think it is. Yeah. If I remember right, I think it is. 
I remember you telling me that when you opened the store, 80% of your clientele was local. And when you closed it, 80% was from out of town. At least. Yeah. Yeah. There, there came a time, I don't know exactly when it started or when it finished, but there came a time where locals in No Valley don't shop locally. And it's a catch-22. If the locals aren't shopping locally, what's the point in having functional stores? If, you're, if you have to depend on tourists for your business, you can't run a hardware store or a store that sells socks and underwear or, you know, whatever. And it just, it came to the point where locals weren't shopping in Mill Valley, out of town people were. So local serving residents or residents serving locals, the businesses disappeared. So now we've got a town full of salons and art galleries. Don't get me started. <laughs> I, I'm being mild. <laughs> We got now. Let's talk about when you decided to close the store. Um, there were a lot of factors. Um, I've been doing it for forty years, which was the main factor. Uh, the rents in Mill Valley got prohibitive. I mean, I was the rent I was paying for the space, the size that I had was you. You couldn't really run a business anymore. And I basically, I, it wasn't as much fun as it used to be. The music business wasn't as much fun as it used to be. I mean, the music business used to be a lot of fun. I mean, we'd have album release parties and this and that, and, you know, it was just, it was a lot of fun and it got to the point. It wasn't fun anymore. Um, I didn't like most of the music that was selling. Um, I wasn't selling the music that was selling. I mean, there were, there was a time not too long before I closed when I would say 90% of the albums on the Billboard Top 200 chart, I had never sold a copy of and nobody had ever asked me for. So it was, it was that kind of turnaround. It just, it kind of took the fun out of it. And my wife had health problems and I wanted to spend more time with her. That was part of it. And it was just, it was, it was a lot of different things and it was just, it was time. And your wife comes from a very music, came, she's passed away, I know, yeah. from a oh, very, very musical family. Her, her mother, her mother was a concert pianist. She was a protege of Jose Torby. Um, her oldest two children, John and Michael, Michael was my wife. Uh, John Cipollina was one of the iconic musicians of the San Francisco Sound. He was a lead guitarist and Quicksilver Messenger Service. Um, younger son, Mario, was bass player with Huey Lewis in the News for years. Um, younger sister, Antonia, has, has been a piano teacher following in her mother's footsteps for decades. I mean, it was an, it was an extremely mu musical family. So. Except for Mike. <laughs> talk about a Lollapalooza of a closing party. I mean, it was an extravaganza. People, musicians came from all around. Talk about- Well, know. there were actually a couple. Um, somebody planned this big closing party at Great American Music Hall, which was, was wonderful. I mean, we had uh, Roy Rogers, Jimmy McCracklin, Sugar Pie DeSanto, uh, Bobby Weir, Betty Levette, uh, the Collins kids. You know, it was just, uh, it was an amazing, an amazing night. But a couple of weeks before that, a local waitress, Sally Spilsbury, who worked at Toast, decided to throw a party. And she organized, the, she'd never done anything like it before. She organized this day-long extravaganza. Uh, we did all afternoon at Throckmorton Theater with um, Nick Gravenides and David Grisman and John Sebastian and Bonnie Raitt and Frankie Ford and 
Sammy Hagar was going to do it, but he broke his foot or something. Uh, he ended up doing the Great American Music Hall party. Um, and then the evening which is, was just a jam session with Vinyl and Jerry Harrison, the Talking Heads, and Jeff Watson from uh, Night Ranger, and one of the guys from Pablo Cruz, and just a, a whole bunch of different people. And it was just these two wonderful, it, perfect closings for the store, I thought. And oh. different. They were they were totally different. They were both absolutely wonderful. With fantastic performances and the whole of all events infused with yeah. love. And so. then we ended up we ended up uh sweet I don't know if people realize this, but Sweetwater and Village Music closed the same day. Mm. September 30th, we closed the same day, hmm. which is the end of an era on a couple levels. It's uh the store on, on Blackdale, 9 Blackdale, it closed. But you still have your foot in the door a little well, bit. Well, yeah, I've got I kind of village light. Uh, village light. Yeah, I've got a storeroom across the street from the store behind Bungalow 44 that I've had since they built the building. It's probably been 35 years, maybe even more than that. I don't know. It's been a long, long time. And I always had the storeroom. So if, like an annex to the figure. Yeah, yeah. It was my little hideout. You know, if somebody asked me for something in the store, you know, I only had room in the store to put out like one of everything. So if I needed an extra copy of something in one day, I could run across the street to my storeroom and grab it and be back in a minute. And uh, when I closed the store, I, I kept the storeroom. I moved everything that was left from the store, crammed it into the storeroom and actually made it fit. There's there's always room. And uh, I open it up every Saturday from noon to four and by appointment for out of town folks during the week. And it's, uh, I probably would miss the store a lot more if I didn't have my little mini, mini man cave. <laughs> <laughs> it is nice to go over there and you can still wander around. And I've heard some good stories and had one. Yeah, and it's still, you. you know, there's still a huge inventory. I mean, there's still got 50,000 albums, 100,045s, thousands of DVDs and VHSs and thousands of posters and thousands of photographs. And it just, you know, there's still, there's still a good cross section, again, of everything, not just one thing. Do you have T-shirts still available? All you, out of t-shirts. I keep meaning to order more and I never get around to it. <laughs> I have to compliment you on your t-shirt collection. In all the photographs and every time I've seen you, you've got the best t-shirts. Well, I've actually, I, I've narrowed, I at one point I had over a thousand of them and I've narrowed it down to like my favorite 300, but I've got, I've got, most of my shirts are 30 to 50 years old. And I very rarely add a shirt to my collection nowadays, but um, I figure, you know, I just rotate. I wear the one on top and the next day I wear the one on top and the next day I wear the one on top. And it just, it adds to the variety. <laughs> they are, it's, you know, well, all I can say is you have exquisite taste. And I have no clothing budget. It's great. <laughs> Okay, well, we, we've, we've got a lot of questions here, I have to say, more questions than I've ever seen for any presentation. So before we go on to that part of the um, tonight's event, is there anything we haven't talked about that you'd like to add? Um, you know, I think we covered it. I would, I would like to thank the people that have supported me all these years. 90% of them, I don't even know their names. I'm, I've had customers for 40 years that I never learned their names. Like if they didn't bounce a check, I never learned their name. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and uh, I want to thank the people that supported me and apologize to the few out there that still hate me all these years later. <laughs> Sometimes you could be cranky. Oh, you think? A little bit. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. They're, they're, there's a lot of people out there that think that's the only thing I can be. No, you're that and, uh, so much more. You know, we all have our good days and bad days. And you know, one of the problems with retail, I don't know if you've ever worked retail, but yes. anybody 
has worked retail will understand me. You can have a hundred great customers in a day, but the one you go home with is the one asshole that came in, you know, and that just, that's just a part of retail. Yeah. Well, I know in the movie you shared with me, um, one nice compliment was a little boy said you were like a skinny, happy Santa Claus. <laughs> yeah. So obviously oh, he, he also said, which is my favorite line in the whole movie. Coming to villages music is almost as good as going to Yosemite. No, uh, Yellowstone. Yellowstone. Right? Yellowstone. He said, yeah. this is the one of the best places I've ever been in. Only place that was as good as Yellowstone. Yeah. That, that is, is a compliment. That is my favorite line in the documentary. Okay. Speaking of the documentary, which hasn't been released, but we can show before we go into Q&A, and it takes, it's a little, what's it like, five minutes long? About, about five minutes, yeah. Five. I think it might be really nice to include the trailer to the documentary so people That'd get a sense. Shall, shall we do that, Franklin? Yeah. Put me in jail. I called my pop to go my bail. He said, son, you're going to drive in a drink because you don't quit driving that hot rod link. There you go. Original wow. version. <laughs> it's Cape Fog at Village Music in Mill Valley, and John Goddard's getting ready to close the place, so we want all the fog guests to stop. I bring some records if you got them. <laughs> John Goddard is Village Music, and Village Music is John Goddard. John is like the gatekeeper of everything that produced what was best about America in the last 50 years. He was such a supporter of great American music and the music community all at the same time. America should honor him because he kept things like old guys like me. I could just hug him and kiss him. John and I are unique friends. He wound up saving literally my career. He understands the value of a recorded piece of music. I would say that my music's been more influenced by music from John's store than any other thing. The store is, is not a store. It's like Christmas, you know, if you're into that sort of thing. Every kind of music imaginable. This is American musical heritage, history and contemporary, all rolled into one. There's an element of it being like a library, not that you borrow the, the records, you have to buy them. <laughs> but you get the feeling that you're sort of walking around in somebody's life work. There's always people from all around the world combing the stacks. It unites a community globally. All the times I've been in that store talking about Ruth Brown, Charles Brown, John Lee Hooker, Howard Tate, Betty LeVette, Albert Collins, I have learned more walking around that store. And if indeed, only loving, baby, call on. I think one of the major impacts from Village Music, and especially John, is, is sort of a tastemaker. He loves all the cool <coughs> stuff and is also you know, very responsible in the sort of resurgence of a lot of careers. I like exposing people to new kinds of music, and if they're musicians, to me it's kind of a payback. You know, they've given me this, you know, and I would like to give them this, you know, and I, I love doing that. I love picking out music for people. You know, it's just, it's probably the single best thing I do in here. He's a very human guy and a very, uh, very good friend, and I, I gotta say, I picked up records here which opened doors for me, and I wrote songs. I remember buying a 10 inch record of uh, Chet Baker singing The Thrill Is Gone and it was only later on I, I found there were words to that song and uh, by that point I'd written Almost Blue which stole all the changes from it. So, yeah. As your own curiosity about music unfolds in time, uh, a different part of the shop becomes valuable to you, you know, but there's nothing more you can do but come and sing a couple of songs and, uh, you know, say thank you.
Okay. That gives you the real fill. That was fun. <laughs> yes, that was. You ready for some questions? Sure. Okay, let's get to it. Here's one from Barry. He asks, who was the first celebrity who walked into Village Music? Who was the last before you closed for the last time? Uh, the first celebrity I can remember coming in the store was probably Kim Fowley, who's a L.A. freak, musician, record producer, among other things. He kind of discovered and managed the Runaways later on. Uh, the last musician in the store was probably David Grisman because he was in... Um, toward the end of the, of the day we closed. Okay, he has another question. Where did you go to college? Uh, I went to University of Santa Clara for two years, West Valley College for two years, and San Jose State for two and a half years. Okay, Barry, that answers your question. Here's one from Jane. Why do you think Village Music became so well known beyond its local borders? Um... It certainly wasn't advertising. I mean, it's it's word of mouth. And I think um, it was word of mouth and a lot of musicians coming in the store. And I think the main factor was the series of parties that Jeannie and I threw at Sweetwater kind of put the town on the map. I mean, we, uh, we got written up in Rolling Stone and a lot of other places. Um, you kind of a combination of both. Barry's back with another question. Rarest record you ever came into your possession? Uh, the rarest record I ever had in the store, which I still have, actually. It, it's still hanging up in my storeroom, uh, is a Jimmy Rogers picture disc that came out uh, when Jimmy, the original Jimmy Rogers, the singing brakeman, died in the early 30s. It was, as far as I know, the first picture record. Again, it's, it's extremely rare. He has another question. Can any country Western celebrity walk into village music? Did I think he means did any and who and when? Uh, Skeeter Davis came in when she was married to one of the guys in NRPQ. Um, David Grisman brought Earl Scruggs in the store. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. And he also brought Red Allen and uh, Del McCoury and several. David Grisman was my country collection uh, connection. <laughs> mm -hmm. Here's one from Keith. How did you decide to sell CDs in the 90s? I think you mentioned that going, uh, going all in on the CDs would have been the business wise thing, the business-y thing to do. Um. Well, I started carrying a few. I, I, I never concentrated on them, but, you know, I, I carried a few hundred cassettes. And then when CDs came out, I started carrying them. But I, I didn't. I had a certain number of bins that I could devote to CDs, and I didn't want to diminish my vinyl collection at, at the expense of CDs. So I never... Once I had this physical boundary for the CDs, I never expanded it, expanded beyond it. It's not that I didn't carry CDs. They were just, they were maybe 10% of my inventory and maybe they never got more than 20% of my business. My business has always been a, a vinyl business. We had a few cassettes there, I remember up front. Oh, we had cassettes, we had eight tracks, we had 78s. I had yeah. a whole room full of 78s. I mean, there was... You know, if it was music, it was valid, and I had some of it. Here is from Jordy. Who drew your Cab Calloway logo? Um, in the early 70s, I put a sign up on the window, said, design a logo for me, win $100 worth of records. <laughs> and this 12-year-old kid named Chris Cosano came in, and he goes, what do you, what do you want on your logo? And I showed him a Cab Calloway album cover. And I said, I want something like this. Because it's just, it's good time music. And it really made me feel good. And can you do anything? 
he went in the back room, came out 10 minutes later with this finished drawing of my logo and said, I can take this home and work on it and improve it. And, you know, but is this sort of what you want? And I said, no, don't take it home. Don't do anything with it. That's it. You've got your hundred dollars worth of records and a lifetime discount. And he did. Oh, wow. That's a great story. He later became an underground comic artist <laughs> many years later. Yeah. Wonderful story. Uh, this is from Prissy. Where did you get your stock? Uh, wherever I could. Um, I ordered new product from distributors wherever I could find them. Um, I started selling you back when I started selling used records, there weren't any used record stores in the Bay area. Um, most books in Berkeley had a few records, the sea of records down on ninth street and ninth street in San Francisco had a basement with some promotional records in it and a few used ones, but there were no used record stores. That just wasn't, it wasn't a thing yet. And I have so many records at home in my record collection. I would quite often buy things twice because I just didn't realize I had them. So I figured I'll take my duplicates into the store and see if I can sell them. And they sold. And I thought this, this is kind of a good idea. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll put in some used records so people don't have to go to Salvation Army and Goodwill to buy their used records. And I did, and it worked. And it just, they grew from there. And then um, later on, in the, probably in the 70s, um, I started traveling a lot and I would go like to the New Orleans Jazz Fest and go to record stores in New Orleans and find records in stores that I could sell for more than what they were selling them for. So I'd buy those and I'd, I'd go to Nashville and do the same thing. I'd go to Austin and do the same thing. And I bought from a lot of warehouses. Um, I bought a lot of stores that went out of business. I ended up with a lot of the stock from rather ripped records in Berkeley and the record house in San Francisco and Ron's records in New Orleans and just different, different. I, I got them wherever I could. Mm -hmm. Here's from Mark. Hey, as a young Mill Valley punk in the sixties, we would hitchhike to downtown and invade Mill uh, in, I think invade Mill Valley, although it has VM. Oh, village music. I was always in awe, perhaps trading comic books for an album. I also am a recovering Catholic and graduated from Wren Catholic. Any My good memories is... from Wren Catholic back in the repressive days? <laughs> um, considering the fact I really wanted to go to TAM, I... I my heart was in TAM when I was in the eighth grade. I really wanted to go to TAM High, but my parents wouldn't let me. Um, I actually had a good time at Marine Catholic. And we got in as much trouble as any of the other schools did. <laughs> you know, there was a there was a lot of drinking, there was a lot of carousing, there was just a lot of everything that was going on in high school in those days. But I actually, um, I had a good time at Marine Catholic, and I don't, uh, I don't regret going there at all. Although it was, it was an interesting little side thing. Um, when I was at Marin Catholic, probably ninety-five percent of us went to mass every Sunday. I graduated from Marin Catholic, went to University of Santa Clara, which is a Jesuit Catholic university. I would say by the end of my freshman year at Santa Clara, 90% of the freshman students were no longer going to mass every set, every Sunday. <laughs> hmm. It just turned around, but, but no, I, I enjoyed Marine Catholic. Here's from Laura. This is not really a question, but I'm going to read it out loud. Um, I used to go into village music all the time, bought all my records there and would make eyes at Nigel. <laughs> Well, she would have to fight Lucinda Williams for Nigel. <laughs> That's a rough fight, girl. She was on a long list of young ladies that came in and made eyes at Nigel. A, <laughs> a very, very long list. I mean, he was he was my eye candy employee. <laughs> he and Monroe Grisman, both of them. They had they had ladies lined up out the door just to come in and say hi. <laughs> hmm. uh, here's one from Ruth. 
Did David Crosby ever come into the store? Oh, I remember David Crosby. Uh, David Crosby came in the store several times. Um, he wasn't as ill-mannered and misbehaved as he was in other places in Mill Valley. Although um, he did come in a couple years before I closed. He came in with his son, and this was after he cleaned up. Uh huh. And um, he came up to the counter and he goes, I'm not sure what I might have done in here in the old days, but I'd really like to apologize <laughs> for whatever it might have been. And I thought, God, that's that's pretty classy. Um, I guess it's step nine, but it's still pretty classy. <laughs> oh, he, he made mischief. That is for sure. Oh, yeah. No, he uh, I was up at Nicky Hopkins one night when Mick, Nicky was living in Mill Valley and he lived next door to David Crosby and there were like motorcycles in the driveway and gunshots going off regularly yeah, it was, yeah, yeah. No, david david was not a great addition to no valley <laughs> thankfully cleaned up um how here's one from barry how about reproducing classic village music t-shirt again i vote yes for that one um someday <laughs> it would do very do well i'm I sure they'd sell it at the sweetwater i, I hope will do that someday Okay, well, I think that's all the questions we have. I do see a bunch of comments. Uh, I'll just read a few. This is Jane. Thank you for being here, John. I grew up on West Blythdale in the 70s and bought my first records from you. Uh, Franklin, you're getting a compliment on your camera work. And uh, here's from Chuck Smith. John's recommendations always work great for me. Uh, let's see. Uh, here's another one. I bought my first record of Village Music. It was a Beatles 45 with Ringo's act naturally on the B side. Can anybody, can't remember what was on the A side. Anybody know? I used to know. <laughs> but that's, that's. That's not a brain cell that's there anymore. <laughs> Howard Tate was one. This is from Chuck Smith. Howard Tate was one of John's recommendations to me. He was so great. Get it while you can is a Howard Tate composition. Uh, I recommended Howard Tate to probably more people than any other artist I recommended. Because mm. his album was one of one of the great, great albums of the 60s. Here's from John. Village Music, John Goddard, is a Mill Valley institution. I went to the grammar <coughs> school above, above Village Music in the 60s, Our Lady of Mount Carmel Catholic School. We would race down to Village Music on Friday afternoons after school to pick up the Fillmore handbills. Hand Still have them. Also, as a broke young teenager, John would save radio station promo LPs every week and let me rummage through the new releases and purchase at a discount. Miss the store. Miss John. John's the best. Wow. This is from Keith. I love the Dutch door. Me too. There aren't enough Dutch doors in the world. <laughs> Agreed. Here's from Sus who says, Gary S. now runs Mill Valley Music at 320 Miller Avenue, Mill Valley, which is true. And it's nice to see. Any comments? It's very nice to see. I'm I'm really glad Gary's there. I'm, he opened after you closed, correct? Oh, right after, yeah. He was planning it six months before I closed. Yeah, no, right after I closed. And he's, uh, I trained him well. He knows a lot about music. Um, his organizational skills leave a little bit to be desired sometimes, but that's a space thing more than anything else. But uh, no, he's done a good job down there. Here's uh, some, Lippy says, Antonio taught our daughter piano. Uh, I love to pick the kids up from the lessons just so I could visit the Cipollina home. Here's, here's Steve says, having a local store like Village Music and a music maven like John on hand was a gift for all of us who lived here. Aside from being a great resource for music, a few of the musicians that I got to see and to meet through John that I remember were B.B. King, Charles Brown, the Fairfield Four, Little Jimmy Scott, Otis Clay, Clara Thomas, Ann Peebles, Luther Tucker, Johnny Johnson, Carl Perkins, Wayne Bennett, Albert Collins, 
Jimmy McCracken, Hank Ballard, Lee Allen, Robert Ward. Who's that from? Fred Hooter. Hmm? Who's that from? It, uh, li- uh, want me to finish the list? Okay. Yes. Yeah. It's from, from Steve Edmondson, oh, Fred okay. Hooter, Carlos Santana, Bonnie Raitt, Pete Sears, and George Frame, Commander Cody. Not to mention the great local musicians that would back the artists that John brought to town, like Austin DeLong, who says hello to you tonight. And sorry, couldn't make it. He's at practice. Uh, J- Tony Johnson and Tim Eschleman. There were so many more artists that I saw or met through John that I can't remember them all. Really, I think he remembered a lot of them here. Good job, Steve. He played with a lot of them. <laughs> yeah. Well, I He's mean, a good guitar player. This great is what player. was going on. Yeah. Here's uh, sure glad I. This is from Jan. Sure glad I went in the store when I lived briefly in Mill Valley. The proprietor at the time was very kind and warm. I remember. Here's from Murray. Just a few left here. Uh, I stayed with Frankie Ford for the day until he came on as a surprise for John. And here's Michael. Hi, John. Really interesting to hear your thoughts about village music and your life. Best Michael Goldberg. Here's Marilyn Bagshaw. I appreciate hear, time Michael's hearing. A, Michael is a great writer, by the way. He's got a couple new books out that are fabulous. Oh, nice. He used to write for Rolling Stone. Oh, thanks for joining us, Michael. Marilyn Bagshaw, I appreciate time hearing John again. Having grown up in Mill Valley as he did, my grandparents arriving before 1900 as he did. My life is dedicated to music. Thanks to Village Music's foundation. Thank you, John and Deborah, for the interview. Uh, excellent presentation. Here's one from Danny. I was the boy, uh, the guy that bought the Cab Calloway record that used to be the logo. I was like 20 years old buying the double cab record. And, then, and when checking out to pay, you said, wait a minute, and put both records in the back sleeve, cut off the cover sleeve, and gave me a discounted price, like for a single album. Like for three eighty eight, I'm thinking. <laughs> I vaguely remember that. <laughs> you just don't get that at the big uh, big record stores if they even have them anymore. I mean, there are so many comments here. I don't really think we have time to include all of them. Oh, somebody has got Act Naturally was the B-side of yesterday. Oh, I don't know if that was the one. I think it was, actually. Yeah. Now think about it. My sister says you taught her about sales tax. She brought in a dollar to buy her first single. Stevie Wonder found out she needed another nickel. That's from Rose (laughs) Thorne. (laughs) I hope I let it slide. (laughs) Michael Goldberg says, great. Such a great conversation. Uh, Oh, here's a good one. Neil writes, roof of village and other shops was easily accessible and a great spot to smoke as a kid. (laughs) Uh, yes. I put it 39, he says. Yeah, now the police used to raid the roof regularly. <laughs> uh, any memories of Frank Zappa, Lippy asks. Uh, I didn't know Frank Zappa, but I met him. Um, I, I saw him a couple of times. Terry asks, I grew up in that store from 12 years old. John was my tastemaker. Aww. <laughs> Emily says, thanks, John, for contributing 45s to the Underground Cafe jute box. That was oh, a I remember that. Yeah. center in the 80s under the old post office. Yep. Here's Michael again says, I used to cut classes and hitchhike from Tam High and hang out in the store. I learned a lot hearing music you play, John. Okay. Um, and this is from Irma and Daniel. Thanks for the program, our locals. I think... I think we pretty much covered it. I uh, think so. Anything? I, I don't know. Did we leave anything out? No, I, mean, I, don't, I don't think we left anything out. I think you did a very I, good job. On a personal note, I have to say that I got a little upset preparing for this talk, um, conversation, because it just reminded me how much I missed the Mill Valley of the time. when your store and other places abounded and and that's something that i i would love to return to mill valley have you uh have you read a book called mill valley days by john myers mm-hmm. oh, okay all right because he was 
almost my age and collected the same things I did, hung out in the same stores I did, knew most of the same people I did. And it's just like a time machine reading his little anecdotes. Dave Getz just uh, wrote a little comment here. I really miss village music. Me too, Dave. I don't think we will see the likes of it or anything like it again. Oh, thank you, Dave. I think that's true. How must it feel to know that you created something so special? A store that is just so much more than sales. It was a gathering place. It was a museum, a destination, a performance <coughs> venue, a work of art, a musical sanctuary. I mean, can you appreciate that you just being John Goddard? But, you know, to me, I, I, was, I was just a fanboy. I got to meet, you know, I got to meet Carl Perkins. I got to meet, you know, B.B. King. I, I, it was just, it was just, that paid for all of it. You know, wow. that really, that, that paid for all of it. And if I could, I can flip that into a, a younger generation, that's wonderful. Wow. You know, I wish I had somebody that could have told me what to listen to when I was a kid. You know, you realized your dreams and in doing so helped so many others as well. So on behalf of the musicians and the community members and all the fans of your store and that love music, I, I thank you for your service and for all the energy you put into. Village. Thank you very much. This has been fun. Yes. Yeah, so I'm going to have to get down to the final business of closing this wonderful conversation. Again, John, thank you so much for your time and for sharing stories now and in the past when we've connected. Uh, I'm happy to announce that beginning February, the Mill Valley Public Library will expand its Listen to the Music art show with a special feature on John Goddard and Village Music. And this exhibit will feature photos, posters, concerts, and memorabilia from John's personal collection. And we'll look into the sociological impact his store had in Mill Valley, in addition to highlighting John's life. And you can find John and Mill Village Music on Facebook. And if no. you like, no, you're still there. I saw you. Am I? Yes. I don't know. I've never been on Facebook. I have no idea. <laughs> oh, well, somebody's got you on there. Oh, huh. uh, Monroe and Jillian might have done it when they were doing the documentary, but I have yeah. never. I... Yes, it has a docu with the affiliation with the documentary. Okay, yeah. So I, people I, can watch the, the trailer again. I, I don't do social media. <laughs> okay, not surprising. Um, but <laughs> you have contributed to our oral, his oral history collection. I have. So we have your oral history. Tim Amex interviewed you and people here at this event that would like to know more about you. <laughs> It can go to the Mill Valley Public Library Oral History Collection, type in your name, and you can listen or read your oral history. My mom's in there, too, if you want to learn about real old Mill Valley. <laughs> okay. Oh, I didn't know. Yes, I'd like to. Um, yeah. And for those that are interested, you can still go, like John said, by his John's Village Music Store Light at 31 Sunnyside, number five in Mill Valley on Saturdays. And... A little business about Mill Valley Historical Society. For those of you who have enjoyed our weekly email history vignettes composed by local historian Chuck Olenberg, you'll be pleased to hear these vignettes have been bound into a new book called Mill Valley History Vignettes, Volume 2. It's a compilation of 152 of Chuck's, Chuck's most recent vignettes, and Volume 2 makes a wonderful companion to Chuck's original book, Mill Valley History Vignettes, which continues to be available in our Mill Valley History Bookstore. Also available in our big bookstore is Adventures of Two Coast Miwok Children, written by my dear friend and fellow board member, Betty Girk. This beautiful book brings alive Marin County's Coast Miwok legacy as it explores the daily lives of a real boy and girl who lived in neighboring villages on San Francisco Bay in the late 1700s. The little boy in the story is named Huik Musa, but he would grow up to be known as Chief Marin, Marin County's namesake. 
It is a precious and truly beautiful book and a great Christmas gift for children and adults. I think that about, oh, there's something else I wanted to remind people that uh, Betty Girk and Chuck Olenberg have both received a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Mill Valley Historical Society and a tree and plaque has been planted and placed at the Mill Valley Public Library. And we're going to have a ceremony in their honor on December 18th at 3 p.m. There'll be music and treats and food and books for sale at the Mill Valley Public Library right near the Smart Guard Garden. Please come join us. Uh, I think that wraps it up. Special th thanks again to John and to Franklin. And of course, special thanks to you, the audience, for your interest in patronage. Please join us next month, that's January 4th, 2023, for a talk about history and maritime heritage of Belvedere and Tiburon with <coughs> Tiburon archivist Dave Gotts. Till then, be well, good night, and happy everything. Good night. Thanks, John. My pleasure. <laughs>